This is the beautiful town hall in the city of St. Nicholas, which lies between Ghent and Antwerp in Belgium. It plays hosts again for the 20th time to the running of the 80th year of the famous Tour of Flanders cycle race. And it's great to be back another season, 1996, and this race drawing some of the finest riders in the world yet again. Yes, this event celebrates its 80th race. It began in 1913, and the Belgians are hoping on this Easter Sunday that the 267 kilometer event will be won yet again by Johan Museo, or will it be their new man on form, Edwig van Hooyerdonk? Now, this race is very famous indeed for its 16 climbs. They all come in the second half of the event. The last climb before the finish is the Bosberg. And, you know, they called Edwig van Hooyerdonk a couple of years ago the boss of the Bosberg because that's where he launched his winning attacks. Let's meet some of the contenders. And with Paul Sherwin is Rolf Sorensen. Well, Rolf, a different team this year, but still the same Tour of Flanders, the kind of race that you like. Yeah, it's a race that's a, it's a very particular race, maybe... The most, for me, I think it's the most uh, beautiful race of all the World Cup races. It's a race where you have to, yeah, you have to be good everywhere. A little bit in the hills, and then the wind and the cobbles. So it's a ri ra race that um, you need particularly good uh, specialities uh, or specialists for the for this race. But you also need a lot of courage because everybody has some bad luck during a day like today. Yeah, sure. Yeah, on as less bad luck you have as bright as it looks you know and uh, that's also of course you can help yourself not having the bad luck and that's what you're gonna try to do in the first uh, 180 200 kilometers here and uh, then it's very important to have a good backup team and for last year's winner of Paris-Roubaix Franco Ballerini so far he's had to be content with fourth sixth eighth and tenth here Fabio Baldato who finished second a year ago would like to go one place better Johan Museo with Paul Sherwin Johan, it was a great ride last year, and everybody says that you're going to be the favourite for this year. Is that a lot of pressure? It's a pressure, yeah, but I don't care the pressure. Uh, I do my race. I know I'm good, so uh, I do my race. But you also have a very good team. The Mape team seems to be the strongest team in the peloton at the moment. We have a very strong team, yes. And when the, when the other ones are looking at me, it should be stupid, but uh, the other ones can, can win also, like uh, Bowman's and uh, Harlebeek. So uh, it's not only me. So it's all for one and one for all. When it comes down to the end, you try, try and help a teammate like Bowman's win, but surely you want to win yourself. Yes, why not? Uh, it's important to win the team. The name is not so important. Always smiling. Well, Michele Bartoli here, third in two classics last year and always races well in Belgium. Unusual for an Italian. Edwig van Hooyedonk, twice a winner, third in 1992. And Andre Schmiel, he was third in 94 and in 95. And the man we all want to know about, Max Chandry with Paul. Well, Max, the morning of the race now, the, the weather isn't too bad, it's uh, not raining. Cobbles are dry. How do you feel? Good. I feel good. I feel ready. Really ready. Want to go. Seems like a lot of people wanted you to win the race in Milan San Remo. A lot of people still want you to win today. Yeah, you know, I mean, some journalists ask me if I want to go for points or I want to go for winning. I mean, I think it's very obvious that I want to go for the win, you know. I feel good and uh, you need to win, you know, so I'm ready. Better watch out for Museo, though. Yeah, he has to look out for me, though. <laughs> Better watch out for Lance Armstrong as well, Max. No, I'm only joking, of course. They're both on the same Motorola team. But just before the eve of the race, Paul spoke with Lance. Final question, then. Lance Armstrong going into Tour of Flanders. Confident? <laughs> I feel strong. I feel. I don't think there's <clears throat> many riders stronger than me. But my, again, my my problem is is that uh, the cobblestones and the pave. I don't know if it's if I'm 100% cut out for that because I don't have the experience, and uh, I, I don't know if I have the technique. But like I said, I have to limit my losses. I, I think that if I can stay out of trouble there, then yeah, I'm confident. Good on you, Lance. And these are some of the rows the riders face. It's not just Paris-Roubaix, you know, that has cobblestones. There's still plenty of them left in the Flanders area of Belgium. And this race seeks many of them out on narrow roads. And they're not all flat like this. The riders will always choose the smoothest bit if they can, as we now join the action here in the first breakaways of the day. There were 185 riders on the start line today for the 80th Tour of Flanders. 
267 kilometers of the race, or 168 miles. We're now entering section number four, the approach to the Oquaramon climb at kilometer 155. And these two riders, Eric de Klerk of Kolstrop, number 212, and with him now is Maura Betten. And this is the little group behind. They've not really been out of sight by a great deal all day. The breakaway going fairly early on. The traditional breakaway as we left St. Nicholas heading out across the top of Belgium before we plunge down towards Deinzer and Tilt and Vargum and then head into the hills, which is where we're approaching now. And here's the old Quaramont. This is the old bit. And this is the bit that really shakes the bones. A minute 40 is all that's left of the lead now. Eric de Klerk, a good old campaigner. And Betting, a rider we don't know a great deal about, but has been on the attack in a number of races this past season. He won only one race last year in Mendricio, and uh, now on the attack here at around about 155 kilometres covered. Looking down the hill here reminds me of a little story. I rode up here with Jim Okovic, the sports director of Motorola, a couple of years ago, and Eric Hyden, who won five gold medals in the late Placid Olympic Games. Jim's not a very good climber, but I never saw the end of Eric. He disappeared over the top of the hill. Those big legs of his proving very useful on the climb. And now onto the cobbles. Look at this lovely crowd here. This is the race in Belgium as far as the classics go. It gets a bigger crowd even in Liège, Baston Liège. It's uh, the magic of the heart of Flanders cycling here, and it looks now as though it's an Italian who has a Belgian in trouble. Eric de Klerk having to hang on and just about hold Betin in his sights as they stomp over the top of the old Quaramont. Approximately 100 kilometres still to race. That's 60 miles left. They're trying to seek just about an inch of good road there, tucked between the grass and the start of the cobblestones. This is Olaf Ludwig here setting the pace. And behind him, it looks as though we've got Frankie... Uh, no, it's Max Chandra who's come on. He's here, Frankie Andrea, but it's Max who's taking close order in this second round of the World Cup. And the Bonesto team, well, they were to ride, but they weren't among the starters because their bikes were stolen on their drive up from Spain, and the bikes were stolen, in fact, in France. So that's rather sad, especially for the young riders like Jeremy Hunt, who was hoping to ride his first Tour de Flanders. Now the counter-attacks are beginning as we start to move clear of the field here. This will begin the sort out now as the roads get narrow. We're into the area down in the Flanders area where the hills will come quite thick and fast. This looks like Rob Sorensen who's starting to push the pace just that little bit now. Sorensen's bang on form, the winner of Kuna Brussels Kuna earlier this year and a stage of Tirreno Adriatico. And he's trying now to get a little group uh, working here because they're slowly dragging in uh, Mauro Betin and Eric de Klerk. They're still split up front, by the way. De Klerk has not rejoined the leader after the climb of the Quaramont. The next big obstacle, well, they're all small obstacles, really, but they are obstacles, will be the Petersburg. And that's climb number five of the 16 bergs uh, sprinkled throughout this event. This looks like Francis Le Marchand of the GAN team, who's now taking up the running at the front. But long turns uh, by individual riders, with uh, one of the MG riders coming up behind him there. A little group trying to go clear. Two of them trying to open a, a gap. We're about 157 kilometers into the race now. And as they head up to the small roads again, the constant reshuffling of the pack at the front as riders try to see the road first. And MG have brought up a number of the riders here right now to keep an eye on affairs because they've got the firepower to win this race and they know it. Well, they took out the first classic of the season with Gabriella Colombo. He rides number 23 in the race today and should be fairly easy to pick out if we catch a glimpse of him in the new leader's jersey of the World Cup. Back up now to the Petersburg, this very narrow climb, and this is Betin finding the only smooth bit of road onto the left, and you have to put up with the gratings there. And look at the crowd opening up now because they know exactly where he'll ride. They expect him to come up on the inside, but they're leaving it rather late. Short and very steep and over the top, and Eric de Klerk is losing ground now. In fact, he's about half a minute back, I think. The clock's gonna tell us exactly as we move over onto the Tides Vichil. As we 
turn right at the top of the little climb of the Petersburg. The next climb that'll come our way will be the Kortakia. That's climb number six. And there we are, just about 30 seconds behind for Eric de Klerk. And then it's not too far back now, less than a minute, certainly, to the reaction coming from the field. And they've decided they want those two leaders a little bit earlier than normal today as they tip over the top of the Petersburg. They're going to be around about 50 seconds behind, no more than that. And the field split. As we see now, what is, the, I think, the main peloton here. Climbing it visibly slower than that chase group. And if you don't really keep in the thick of the action early on, you're just constantly going over these small climbs. Big groups just disappear, and you don't see them again in the Tour of Flanders. But the weather today is reasonably good. It's a little bit chilly, but basically, it's not a bad day. And now you can see a very typical race in Belgium. The flat area, the race of the peloton is individual. All of the riders scrabbling for wheels. And this is so typical of racing in this area of Belgium. Vetter, 33 seconds, 56 seconds back to the first part of the peloton. Now, I'm pretty sure we've got people like Baldato in that chase group. Now got themselves into a very good rhythm here. They're not going to hold them off much longer, that's for sure now. And there we are, it says, another 11 climbs to come and 12 stretches of cobblestones. The Mappe boys gritting their teeth and want the MG boys to come and give them a hand. Patrick Lefebvre's team versus Giancarlo Ferretti's team. Two big names in the world of team management these days. And our little man on the bicycle on the left-hand corner of your picture, counting down the kilometres to the next small climb, which will be the Kortikia, which will take us to 165 kilometres into the race, about 103 miles or so. And this little group trying to establish uh, a working audience here so they can pull clear and pick up the two riders out front who are now alone on the road. Well, as we watch the chase down here, it's interesting to note the Onse team are not here again. Laurent Jalabert is still a question mark on his fitness. And again, the Spanish lineup ignoring a World Cup event. They don't really show a lot of interest at all in the World Cup races. They seem to be a team for the multi-day races. Everybody knows who rides this race, that the main challenges come towards the end. Uh, the Mur de Gramont and the Bosberg, the last two big climbs. That's our speed indicator there, and they're going very quickly at 66 kilometers an hour and climbing at the moment. Little group of three trying to bridge the gap. And we're getting quite a bunch of strong men here, and once we can get down amongst them, we'll be able to pick out exactly who they are. But this is a very strong group, and at the moment, I'm certain Johan Museo is down there. Rupert Peters, and I think that's Eric Zabel in the telecom colours. They come off the bend and start to accelerate away. Oh, and that's uh, Schmill. Schmill has gone down. I have no idea how that happened. He didn't seem to touch a single rider. He just seemed to completely pull his bike off the road. But a very nasty fall indeed for Andre Schmill. He's the man who's finished in third place for the past two years. Just as that little bunch was starting to establish itself, now the rest of the peloton are coming by. Oh, I hope we get a look at that again, because Schmill actually appeared to touch nobody. It was almost as if he ripped his bike off the surface of the road, trying to spin out of that corner. He's up and away, and he's going to join in the back of that group. But that was a nasty-looking crash, and thankfully it looks as though the man from Moldavia isn't hurt as he starts to get back into the action. We're still 103 kilometres, almost 104 kilometres from the finish, about 65 miles to go, and there's a little express train coming past him there, so Schmill can mix it with those and with a bit of luck he might get back into the action at the front but I think he fell from a group there that was beginning to establish quite a lead he won't be happy with that and he's, he's playing with the round with his back brake there as if he's uh, not too happy with the way the bike is handling at the moment but he's found himself a teammate to ride behind and let's have a look at it again here we go now watch him come down he's halfway down the line here we came into this corner very, very quickly indeed. The riders were hitting this corner at 65 kilometers an hour, don't forget. And you need to look about five or six men from the back of the group as he comes into our picture now. Watch him in the center of our picture. He accelerates away, looks over his shoulder, and then seems to pull his bike off the floor. A very ugly fall for Andre Schmill, that. It's 
always a little bit uh, upsetting when you fall down on your front because you somehow don't seem to be able to protect yourself quite as well as if you go down on your back. But because of the cold weather today and the arm warmers, he's probably saved his elbows a little bit of a, a grazing session there. Anyway, back up to the man who's leading the Tour of Flanders, the 80th edition, don't forget, at the moment. There were big celebrations at the start this morning for the 80th running of what Belgium see as their final single-day event. And the 24 teams are now spread all around Flanders. It's been a very quick race as we now begin the hill number six, which is Kortekir. There's the details. 8% is the gradient, and it's 600 metres long with an average... Uh, climb, the steepest climb in the middle of 6%. Well, the man who's about to tackle it first is Amaro Betin from the Refin team, a team, by the way, which has now attracted Jamaluddin Abdu Jakarov, the great sprinter this year, who has left what was Novell and is now the Rabobank team. Many changes as the old guard also, we start to see a lot of riders of uh, names we know retire and new ones come in. This is the composition of that breakaway now. Johan Museo, the hot favorite, is right there. Last year's winner wearing number one. And Wilfred Peters, Baldato, who was second, is also there. Bartoli is there. Cipollini, the sprinter, I'm surprised about that. Ekimov, uh, Cipollini wasn't having such a great race in Milan San Remo, but now a little bit of a turnaround of the form. Huh? Speak of the man, there he is, right on the front on the left of our picture. Alongside him here is uh, Johan Museu. The hot favorite, of course, to repeat his victory of a year ago. And he just loves this event, always had. The last three years, he's had uh, two firsts and a second. And here we are on the climb of Kortikia. And the Mauro Betin, I think he knows now that very soon he's going to have big company with all of the favourites firing. They're just 40 seconds behind him. He's keeping the pressure on, but this hill is going to hurt those legs. The traditional escape and the traditional capture is about to come our way. Vyatislav Yekimov going through the bottom of our camera there, Lars Mikkelsen. Winner of Gemp Wevelgum a year ago. He'll be defending that title soon. He's off to the right trying to have his lunch, but it looks a bit tough. And now the counter attacks are coming thick and fast here. They're trying to get another move underway because they feel that perhaps that this breakaway is a little bit unmanageable. Counter attack coming here from Gianluca Piangonda. And Piangonda has just about latched onto the back. We've got four riders now trying to go clear. Second in the Junior World Championships, uh, Piano Gonda in Colorado Springs. That's a few years ago now. And he's latched onto the back of these four riders. And as you can see, these super narrow lanes, but the motorbikes, I'm afraid, are forming the final bridge here up to the refin rider, Betin. And <laughs> having said that, the whole peloton have come out of nowhere, which means that Andre Schmil picked up the right train. He's going to recover from his crash and we'll be right back in the thick of the action now. So a lot of riders come back. A sudden slowing of the pace as we went up the Kortikia. And I think we're going to find ourselves with a complete peloton very, very shortly. The poor winter in Belgium has sped into spring too and uh, the trees, as you can see, are not really sprouting their leaves just yet. Mauro Betten now suffering the same fate as the breakaway companion, Eric de Klerk. He sits up, he free wheels. Because his next challenge of the day now, I think he's going to be just keeping up with the peloton. We can forget the small climb still to come. Our next climb of the day will be the Tienberg. Nine more little climbs to come. 11 more stretches of Parve. That's what our, our little sign means. We're now on the Tienberg here, and the MG boys again showing us their proficiency at setting the pace. One Festina rider on the right mixing it with them. And still riders coming onto the back of that peloton. And that's the actual honours list of the Tour of Flanders since 1986 when Adrie van der Poel, the current World Cyclocross champion, was the winner in 86. 
Now Van der Poel, a very versatile bike rider. Gianni Bunyo winning this race in 94, which rather upset Johan Museo because he got beaten by uh, Bunyo and it cost Museo a victory for the past three years. Sitting around at the back here, Fabiano Fontanelli and Fontanelli having a great season. And rider 94, Emmanuel Mannion, also starting to ride rather well for Festina. On to the Tyenberg, 17% is at the steepest point and it's a very tough little hill, the Tyenberg. A chance here for the riders to springboard away. As you can see the height above sea level, virtually nothing at 56 metres, but it is the shortness of the climb and the steepness and the regularity of them that make the riders really hurt on these climbs. And they're always on narrow roads too, and with the crowds, they're often feeling even narrower. Cobbles indicated, Cassian. And that's why the riders are forcing the crowd to stand up the grass banks there because they want to get that little bit of solid concrete on the left of the road. As the rider setting the pace up is the lieutenant of Museo, Wilfred Peters, and there is Museo. Sitting behind Wilfred, who will be prepared to commit himself 110% now to keep him in the action. That was Mannion who went through the picture there for Festina. And as always, Johan doesn't give much away with his face. There's Mannion, and now we've got an attack by uh, Brian Holm. This will be Brian Holm for Telecom, who's gone. Mannion starts to chase him down, or does he? Because Brian Holm has opened up a gap here. Over the top of the Tyenberg. And Andre Schmill, well, the man who fell has brought himself right up to the leaders now. He's fourth in line of this group. Magnon. He's trying to join Brian Holm on the attack. And Brian's starting to look a bit frisky because he's been around the scene for an awful long time, but uh, he looks to have pretty good form this year. And there's a flat back tire. I think it's Olaf Ludwig. Or is it Brian Holm? It's Brian Holm. He's just gone clear, and now he's got himself a flat tire. Well, that's bad luck. And the trouble is that Holm has split the field in pursuit of him. He'd broken that uh, leading group up completely, so the team cars are going to be a little time getting to him now. He's going to feel a little bit exasperated because, you see, he was going to stop, realised there was nobody coming. Yeah, I, can, I know exactly how he must feel. He's watching the race go away from him. By the time they get him a bike now, he could be over a minute. Look at that. They've gone. He's left only with our television camera who can do nothing about it because we don't carry spare wheels. And it's probably just as well we're not going to hear what Brian Holm uh, might say in a few minutes. He keeps looking over. This is the drawback of uh, the narrow roads. And his teammate, there's a teammate arrived, taking his foot out, and we'll give Brian another one further up the road. And this is one of the Rabobank riders here, and it looks to me very much as though we've now got Rolf Sorensen in trouble. So the rider who was third in 1991, also coming out of that leading group, which I've estimated to be around 40 riders strong, and the team cars on these narrow roads simply can't get through. There might be a case here, you know, for the riders, uh, for the teams rather, to have their mechanics on motorbikes like they do in Paris-Roubaix, because at least they would get to the riders a little bit quicker. Now we're on to the Eichenberg, and this is climb number eight at kilometre 178. And again, the Mappe boys are setting the pace and turning the screw that little bit tighter. They know they've got a couple of good names in trouble. Sorensen will be a rider. They will be happy to see gone from this group. Those that know, in fact, he's gone. This is Emmanuel Manu, and that's Taffy on the right. Uh, Andrea Taffy, a great pacemaker. Remember him last year in Paris Bay did a brilliant job uh, before he saw uh, Ballerini take the race. So Taffy setting the pace here now on the Eichenberg. Another cobble climb trying to break up this rather unmanageable big leading group here. Very quickly followed by the Volkenberg. And this is climb number nine on the list, 181 kilometers covered now. And sitting right in here, and there he goes through our picture, Alexander Gonchenkov, who featured so well in Milan-San Remo. 
Lance Armstrong, that big rolling figure of Lars, sitting behind Andrea Taffy at the minute. This looks like Bortolami here. Lars Mikkelsen. Manuel Mannion. And in fact, it's not Bortolami, that is Taffy, so the other yellow crash helmet is worn by Bortolami. The two Mape boys showing the pace at the front. And I think uh, Taffy would like the motorbike to move just that little bit further away from him. Very compact little group at the Varenberg. These little hills come thick and fast, a steep point of 13%, a height of only 68 metres above sea level. Nobody finding the pressure necessary yet to break away. Edwig van Hoyedonk on the right, the man they used to call the boss of the Bosberg, as I said earlier. But trapped today in the peloton. On the Leberg, climb number 11, there's still no change here. The riders are all together, the tempo being set consistently, but not breaking anybody up at all. Steep little climb. Rolf Yerman is the rider setting the pace on the front. As he did, he said he set the pace quite a bit in Milan San Remo as well. Mannion has done an enormous amount of work for the Festina team. And that group's still around about 20, 25 riders strong and everybody anxious to rush through towards the Molenberg, a four-star climb with its 80% steepest point and yet only 33 metres, around about 100 feet above sea level. And look at this now on the Molenberg. Johan Museo has decided he wants to break this group up. He's just 50 kilometres from the finish. And of all people following him, it's Mario Cipollini on the left of our picture who's trying to hang on to Museo. Well, Museo has won this race when he was the champion of Belgium. Uh, the current champion of Belgium is Wilfred Nelson. He's a sprinter. Museo isn't a pure sprinter anymore. And he looks over his shoulder after a tremendous power climb there and he finds with him none other than Cipollini, not a rider that Museo will want to carry right through to the finish, although I'm not too sure that Cipollini could go right through to the finish. But anyway, we'll find out because now they have a small gap. Museo sitting on the wheel. And it looks as though it was just four seconds as they came over the top of the climb. As the two riders are hanging on, well, you've got to start somewhere, and there's a small gap there, but Museo will not want to go too far without a little more help. He won't want to go alone, and I don't think uh, Cipollini will be able to give him too much help over the climb still to come, especially the Mur de Gramont or the Bosberg. And André Schmill seems to have recovered well from his little tumble because he's right in number two wheel here as they bring back these two leaders. Johan Museo and Mario Cipollini. And Museo assesses the situation. And he's seeing a fragmented chase group. But you know, it's still a good 40 riders there. He's decided it's not worth going on. He's going to hang on and try again somewhere else, I would think. Cipollini, no doubt, happy to be in agreement with that. More than 200 kilometers covered now as we go towards the next climb of the day, which will be the Berendris. And that leaves us with four climbs still to come, including the Berendris. And Museo will constantly want to be in the action now. He will want this group to thin out quite dramatically before the finish. If he's going to take it, because uh, he's not a big group sprinter anymore, and there are one or two sprinters in this group still. The open plains of Flanders, so different from the other part of Belgium, of course, the Ardennes, which is wooded, and big concrete mountain climbs, which we'll see in the upcoming Liège-Bastogne-Liège. And there's still one rider tempting them to come out and play here, but there's nobody. And it looks like a Motorola rider who's put his head down at the front at the moment and gone for it. Now, that could be Max Chandry who's put in an attack. He's being joined here by Lars Mikkelsen. It is Chandry and Lars Mikkelsen of Denmark, winner of Gent Wavergum. And Pianagonda. Pianagonda, who had a very good uh, season last year to project himself as a name to watch out for, has now projected himself into a group of three, which has been spearheaded by Max Chandry. 
Chandri still carrying the scars of the loss of Milan San Remo, but he has very good form this year, Max. And if he could just get this small group going, the fact is, though, they need a Mape rider here. Uh, because of the strength of that team, they're going to be chasing hard until they put a man in a breakaway, and then they might ease off a little bit. So Max Chandri, Mikkelsen, Piana Gonda, about 206 kilometers covered. 22 seconds to the, what we're calling the Museo group. And in fact, that's gone up from 16 seconds, uh, so they are going clear at the moment. And that will cause a little bit of consternation because once we get to the Berendriest, we might see the gap open. And it's the powerhouse of Mape, Taffy, who is again doing all of the workhorse work at the front. He's never afraid to put in more than his weight behind the wheels there. Lance Armstrong, number three wheel, just trying to disrupt affairs for Motorola while he hopes Max Shandy will get away. So Motorola got the two top men up here today. Maybe they can do something with that. Brian Holm, number 103, he was the rider we saw flat, and this looks to me as though he's coming across the gap. Carlo Bowman's number four with the Mape team also coming across, so that's a great ride by Holm. And now the usual hesitation as the riders want to see somebody else come to the front and do the work. This is Max Chandri. There's his positions in the world rankings. Now he's currently 24, slipped only slightly. His highest place of 20th achieved at the end of last season in the world rankings. But these three look as though they've still got plenty of fight in those legs to try and open this gap. Lars Mikkelsen of Denmark has a little problem actually with his saddle or under his saddle because he has a boil where we don't really talk about and he may have to have that operated on. He's a bit worried about it, but anyway, he's come out into the breakaway and he's joined the leaders. Perhaps trying to bring himself onto the sort of form that uh, won his only win last year was the great uh, classic Ghent Wavelgum. And uh, that wasn't a bad win either because he outsprinted Maurizio Fondriest for it. And Piano Gonda in that breakaway, a stage winner in the Tour of Spain last year. One of only two wins. The other one was in the Reggio Tour, Tour of the Regions. Uh, with not a light, nothing like the strength of the quality of field as the Tour of Spain, so he's a rider who's progressing very, very well now. He was second overall in the smaller Tour, the Tour of the Regions. And now it looks to me as though this bunch is slowly reorganizing themselves here because they've got extra help in Carlo Bowman's. The Mappe boys. And is Brian Holmes still behind? No. In fact, that, uh, that rider there is Laurent Brochard, the Frenchman on the Festina team. There's the grimace of Andrea Taffy, indicating he's feeling the chill air from Italy because he's wearing quite thick woolly gloves there. And the gap is still going up. This is looking good for Shandri Mikkelsen and Piana Gonda. 44 seconds now, and this isn't a group which is hanging around. They're all willing to chase, it seems. Museo sitting at the back of the race here. Olaf Ludwig just coming through on it. No, Rolf Aldag that was from the uh, telecom team. The man who featured that long breakaway in Milan San Remo. And bouncing over the cobbles there was Lon Desbien from the GAN team given team leader status today in the absence of the Englishman Chris Boardman. That's Desbien going up on the outside. Brochard flashing through the camera. Taffy. Somebody is actually accelerating quite well at the front because there's an awful lot of gaps between these wheels. Lance Armstrong goes through. Fabio Baldato. Konchenkov. Well, they're absolutely flying off over these cobblestones. Oh, and that was a big hole, too. Emmanuel Mannion bouncing across the cobbles. And certainly they seen somebody as really... That was Fondrias just passing through. Here he is. Andre Schmill passing him without a glance. Fondrias leaving the door open a little bit, and Andre won't like that too much. And Fabio Roscioli. 
So it's a pity we can't get up to the front and see who actually is applying the pressure now because somebody has really turned the screw a little bit tighter. This is Brochard. And number 12 is uh, Michela Bartoli, so he's made the split as well. Man who had third in Liège last year and third in the Tour of Lombardy. Smooth roads, a chance for the legs to recover for just a few seconds before we head off into the climbs again. Debian. Well, I must say, this looks to be such a good working group at the moment, I'm not too sure that that three-up is going to stay away too long. We're well inside 50 kilometres from the finish. They're giving it 34 seconds, so they've pulled back 10 seconds in a workmanlike fashion there, the Museo group, and not with the help of Museo either, because he was sat at the back. There are the three leaders, Chandri and Piana Gonda decided to go on to the side of the road because, as the little graphic indicates, we're on the cobbles again. 30th was his finish in the Tour de Flanders last year for Piana Gonda, so he knows what it's like, he knows the course. And now heading on to, that's uh, officially the 50 kilometre to go point, that's 31 miles to go. Well, that should give him a little bit of impetus. Max seems to enjoy racing down the cobbles as he stays in the big gears and chooses the way down. And this is a problem here. And we've got another puncture here, and it looks as though Andrea Perron has gone out of the group with a flat tyre. Jim Okovic is right on hand. And so is Jeff, the mechanic. Now, Jeff, you're under pressure here. The whole of the world is watching you. We've got to get a, a good change and get him back in before those cars start to drift. And you can see the experience of Perron casually back on his bike and back into the race. So Perron will have a bit of work to do if he's going to feature now because he's got to move his way up. And it looks to me as though now Carlos Bomas, who came up to this group, is now prepared to work for his team and set the pace with Laurent Debien in second place as we head into the feed now at Zotterkum. Lars Mikkelsen taking out what he fancies and getting rid of what he doesn't. There's the souvenir. This little town of Zottergum. I want to finish third in a race here. Must have been luck. And away, slips to the right, slips to the right and now they're going to have to get on with it because the gap is nothing at all here. It's almost as if they are not fancying their chances. They don't seem to be. I mean, they came very casually through that feed zone and we're looking at around about... Uh, 27 miles, no more to go to the finish. And they must be very conscious of the fact they don't have a Mappe rider here. They know the strength of that team. They know that team has to be chasing. Piano Gonda taking as much drink as he can on board. There's not the urgency of racing to get through, to swing through and off and keep the momentum of this breakaway. Max seems to be doing a little bit more than his fair share here. 23 seconds now, gone out very slightly, so the group may well have slowed down to take on fuel at Zottegum as well. There they are, and Bowman's, Bowman's is the workhorse for the maps. Armstrong is the blocker for the motor rollers. He's just going to ride number two wheel and hope he can disrupt the system a little bit. Carlo Bowman's a former champion of Belgium, but like so many Belgians now, seems to have found his way to the teams in Italy, where I think the pay is better. Uh, but also, you have to work a lot harder, as Carlo is finding out these days, as he sets the pace here now to try and set up uh, Johan Museo for the win. But they've still got to figure out how they're going to close down this gap. Andre Schmil always seems to ride near the front of the peloton, but never puts in any work. He just watches the wheels and keeps an eye on the system, but he doesn't make any of the pace until he's sure he'll get something out of it. And he rides always fourth or fifth wheel. 
Nobody willing to assist Bowman. Certainly not Lance Armstrong there in second place. There's the four climbs remaining. We're on the Berendries. Then we've got the Volkenberg. Then the Muir. That's enough to send a chill down your spine. And then the Bosberg. And then you go as quick as you can as you scuttle for the line. This is still a big group. It's unusual for a Tour de Flanders to have quite such a big bunch at this stage. There's still a lot of riders well capable of winning this event. And Schmiller's moved up into second place. Now, careful, Andre, you could find yourself at the front at this rate. As the gap continues to fall, 17 seconds down, and still Carlo Bowman's is making the pace. There's Andre Schmill. The year he won Paris-Roubaix, he lived literally just around the corner, so it was almost a home victory for him. He's moved house now. And we've got a strong attack going here. And this is the sort of attack which will start the reaction I think the race is looking for now to try and eat into that lead. And the attack comes from Roslotto, ZG Mobili. And it looked to me as though it was Alexander Gonchenkov trying to hurt them a little bit there. We've still got this very large group, and we've still got just those three or four climbs still to come. But they are the most difficult in the Tour of Flanders. On the entourage, it's a long way down if you made a bad draw today at the end of that long column of team cars, because you are a long way behind the action. Our helicopter moving up to this small breakaway group. They've hung on in there, but they still have not really escaped the grip of that very hard-working back bunch. They've been out there now for around about 22 kilometers in the lead, Johan Museo, and uh, just on his right there is Gonchenkov, another attack being launched there. It looks like it might be Serpolini who's gone out of the front of the group. Number 117, the rider is looking pretty tired at the moment, Fabio Roscioli. But this is all coming back together again here. Five riders getting up towards the front of the race and creeping that little bit closer to the escapees. But you know, that could work in the favour if a small group can reach them. Then Shandri, Mikkelsen and Pianagonda would welcome a small group because then they could get really stuck into the move. They need a Mape rider in that group to succeed. They know it, I think, because there are so many Mape riders in this chase down. And the biggest of them all is right here. Johan Museu, never out of the first three, the first two even, in the last three years of the Tour de Flanders. These narrow, twisting roads around Flanders, which uh, many of the Belgian cyclists spend hours training on them, usually in the rain at this time of the year. The gap is now down to just 10 seconds. There has been a general regrouping in the chase. Museo's group, as we're calling it, is now just about to capture those three riders. And I would say that would give them a breakaway that's lasted round about 23, 24 kilometres since they went. And this is Lars Mikkelsen sitting here at the back of the three. Piana Gonda and uh, Max Shandri. Well, when Shandri gets caught along with the other two, he will still see that with this group is his team captain, Lance Armstrong, so the Motorola still have a chance. And Max may not have given his all either to this breakaway, some 15 miles out in front, but they never really got clear. And there's the group led around by Gonchenkov. He was on the inside for Maurizio Fondres, his team leader, is also in that group. And the Lotto is actually quite well represented up here at the moment. I think they've got three riders in this breakaway. And now the counter-attacks are going to start, I think, once they bring them back. It's still a lot of wheel bridging from the back of the line. That's the hard part. If you can't get round the corner first, then you spend a lot of time closing down gaps left open by others. Peeling down through the trees at the head of the Tour de Flanders, bar just those three riders, and there's an attack that looks like Maurizio Fondries going there. So, classic move. If it is Fondries, it comes just at the right time, and it is indeed Fondries, and he's on the attack now, so Maurizio has put in a big attack here to try and go clear. 
And right with him there, it looks as though he's got for company Rolf Yerman, the former champion of Switzerland. So Fondriest and Yerman, around about 41 kilometers to go to the finish, have put in the attack. They've swept up the breakaways. We've got two new leaders now. And Maurizio Fondriest, who used to live here in Belgium when he was racing on the team of Peter Post. That was the Panasonic team, but he seems to have refound his old form by returning to back to Italy. And uh, he was one of the few Italians, though, that really did seem to settle in Belgium. It's very difficult. It's such a different lifestyle for the Italians. But now Fondriest, 31 years of age, Maurizio now, turned pro in 1987. Joined uh, by Rolf Yerman, two very strong men here. And Fondriest returning to his form after 1994 when he had a disc problem with his back and he's now sort of more or less refound himself. But another service wheel there and this time it really are some bad luck for the telecom boys today because that is Olaf Ludwig this time who's punctured. And Ludwig is going to have to fight back. Look at those beautiful legs of the man who won the gold medal for East Germany in the Seoul Olympic Games. And Ludwig probably riding out his last season. Another big name we won't see in the peloton next year. But uh, things change for him at the right time. And a little tap there on the, on the backside of Eddie Manzolani from this Aiko team to say, come on, we can get back on here. But we're going back up to the leaders. Maurizio Fondries, the pace being set by Rolf Yerman. And Fondries winning Milan-San Remo in 1993, but that was a superb year because he won 25 races that year. He also won Flesh Wallon. He finished third in the Leeds Classic, third in Liège, Baston Liège. He won the World Cup, second in Paris Tours. You could go on forever. That was the year of Maurizio Fondries, 1993. As we now go on to the Berendris, 13% at its steepest point and an average of around about 7%. And the Bellandrice now coming at 229 kilometers into the stage, which means there are 25 miles still to go as Andre Schmill now does come to the front and really tries to stretch this group. They obviously want to contain what is the most serious attack so far, really. And Fondriest knows if he can get clear, then he's going to have a big problem bringing him back. Mill coming right up to our motorbike here as he turns in a very good uh, turn of speed at the front here to try and thin down this little group, but they are so tenacious today. Nobody seems to want to drop off, but Schmill's job has been well done because there's Maurizio Fondrias coming back into the fold. He really is, uh, as Robert Miller says, an immaculate bike rider, isn't he? Even when he's under pressure, it hardly looks as though it's really hurting him. Anyway, that's the way thing to do. When you see your teammate caught, you go for it yourself. And Alexander Gonchenkov now has also decided to turn the screw. Sorry about this little bit of picture breakup. Uh, as usual, it's the microwave problems we're having reaching the signals up to the helicopter. Gonchenkov on the attack. Shamil somehow has found the strength to dig again as we go over the top of the Belendris. And it looks as though Gonchenkov was happy with the prize at the top because he sat up immediately. As we go down a little bit now, and he's, there's a split in the group, or is there? Seven or eight riders, uh, obviously not too keen on breaking the weight. We all decide now is the time to take a drink and reassess the situation. 24 miles from the finish. Museo leading us down the hill, followed by Schmill, and the little graphic there said three hills to come and two stretches of Parme. Still lying ahead, and the biggest, big daddy of them all, the wall of Gramont, Muir, that comes as uh, the penultimate climb of the day. If you've got the strength, that's where you hammer home the advantage. Still an awful lot of riders left in in the 80th Tour of Flanders Classic. Out on the start line at the start this morning in the Market Square of St. Nicholas, there were 185. It looks as though we've got some in the region of 20, 25 riders at least are still in that group. And there's little gaggle of riders trying to rejoin after that climb. There we are, confirmation, 36 miles to go. We're in the Belgian town, approaching the Belgian town of Brackel. There's Taffy again, a 
and Rolf Yerman watching Taffy. And this is Vasseur up behind him now from the GAN team. Cedric Vasseur. Still they can't find the combination which might get away from this group. Museo's tried, Fondriesta's tried, and now another attack from Vasseur. Cedric Vasseur is pushing it on. Looks like Ekimov, winner of the Tour of China. At the end of last season, he's pushing it on, but they're not getting it away yet. And now again, it's left to Max Chiandri, who has been very attentive since he was caught, has now tried again to go clear. So Chandri quite clearly is not out of it yet, despite the fact he made that breakaway of some 23, 24 kilometers. Gonchenkov, who rode so well in Milan San Remo, is also paying attention. He's watching every move today. And they might have a little split going here. And the rider here is Gabriella Misaglia from the San Marco group. And that uh, group, by the way, is managed now by Bruno Liali, who uh, in his later years finally got the race lead for a day in the Giro d'Italia, and he also was the Italian champion. Just retired, now looking after the San Marco group team. Two, four, six, eight, nine riders getting clear there. Johan Museo is in this group. Ekimov, Chandri, uh, Misaglia, Schmil, I think we've got Michele Bartoli down there as well. We've certainly got Gonchenkov. I've seen him. And the man with the flowing locks I caught a glimpse of is Laurent Brochard. He's in this breakaway as well for Festina. Now, this is a combination that could work. As we head towards the Volkenberg, 53 meters above sea level, the Volkenberg, and this is a climb which is coming at the 234 kilometer point of the race. Cédric Vasseur at the back of the group at the moment. Johan Museo just ahead of him. This is now a tasty little breakaway group here with all the teams represented. André Schmil for Lotto. Max Chandri for Motorola on the move again. And this is Laurent Brochard as we've got an attack up front by Gonchenkov for Ross Lotto. So this is a strong move now as we start the climb of the Volkenberg. They come thick and fast, and they're short, these climbs, but they really do hurt. Look at the face of André Schmil on the right here. And the cool face of Mr. Poker player himself, Johan Museu. Max has chosen the right wheel to follow. Gonchenkov slips a little, back, a little way back down the line. And it looks to me as though Peter van Pietergum for TVM has also realised that's a pretty good group, and TVM haven't got a man in it. He's trying to get across. But again, the lack of cohesion, nobody wants to push on. It's probably because they don't like the thought of having Museo in the group at all. And Van Pietergum here, I think, has slipped away from the front. Because Van Pietergum went on the bottom of that climb, or camera stayed with this lead group, and they're now bringing Van Pietergum back. Konchenkov is the man setting the pace. There's Brochard, Ekimov. Max Chandri, Cedric Vasseur. And there is the compilation of that breakaway group, as we've called it. The man missing is Peter Van Pietergum, but I think he's going to be with us very soon, if not behind. Making 11 riders now have made this breakaway group here. And there is Beat Ziberg, also trying to get across. And this is the Carrera team rider. Claudio Chiapucci, the big favourite, by the way, with the crowd, uh, not riding in the Tour of Flanders today. So Beat Ziberg is the man who's got the team captaincy. The rider up front, in fact, is Peter Van Pietergum now. Piet Zieberg can get up there, then maybe they will contact the lead group because, in fact, Peter van Pietergum is behind the group. This is 
Cedric Vasseur at the tail of it. And a good combination now because the map here have got the riders up here they want. So too is MG. Ross Lotto have gone Chinkov, but Rabobank have got Ekimov. Estina have got Broshaw, Lotto have got Schmil, Motorola Shandri, the big teams. It doesn't leave a lot of chase power back in that field there now to pull them back, and Museo may have read this right. The only thing that could cause the stumble is the fact that the riders in this breakaway will not really want to carry Museo to the finish. There's ten riders down there. Second round the bend, Max Shandry, his second big breakaway move of the day. He is racing very, very well at this time of the year. He's riding superbly. And here comes the arrival of Bietzberg. So we've now got 11 men up front. Sitting at the back, Peter Van Pietigum, who bridged the gap as well. That was a good ride by Peter. And Max is the end of the original breakaway here, for the moment at least. Now he isn't, because uh, back comes Andre Schmil. Broshaw takes out his uh, final bit of fuel for the day. And there is the complete compilation now of the breakaway, and it's good. And amazingly, only two Italians in the breakaway. The country must be cracking. I doubt it. The Tour of Flanders has never been a kind race for the Italians over the years, but uh, over the past couple of years, of course, with the Italians taking on such a grip on world cycling, Tour de France, like any other race, has had more than its fair share of success for them. Gianni Bugno uh, winning here. Andre Tappi in the centre of that group there. This is quite a nice little chase group, but I don't think it's going to get on terms now unless it really has to work hard. And Mario Schiria from the Saiko team is up here in the chase as well. And that's Franco Ballerini. So this is a pretty powerful second group that's forming behind. But Ballerini isn't going to chase down his teammate, that's for sure. Edwin van Hooydonk, number 73. Well, he's the man that they used to call the boss of the Bosberg. He's not only won the Tour de Flanders twice, but he's also won the amateur Tour de Flanders before he turned pro as well. Seems to have refound himself a little bit uh, this year, Edwin. A big talking point when he did turn pro because his first shot at Paris Roubaix, he finished fifth. Now, is that group making any progress or not? Little Gabriella Misaglia seems to be having a little bit of trouble hanging on to the tail of the group here. Konchenkov under control. What a good rider he's turning out to be now. Really seems to be uh, coming into full bloom. He's lucky for his first win of the year, but he's had second on the overall in Tirano Adriatico and second in Milan San Remo. So the win can't be far away. And again, he's been in the thick of the action all day today. And this is a pretty good group now that's come together at the front. Still the Mur de Gramont to come, the climb of the wall. Steep and very cobbled towards the top. And this main field behind now really has lost a lot of its impetus because there is nobody really to organize the chase. The combination of this breakaway has, fall, has fallen almost into perfection now. It's exactly what the riders wanted. They'll be a bit unhappy to find Museo in it. Uh, but even so, there's still only a 10 second gap here. Van Hooydonk a little bit slow to respond, gritting his teeth. But he respond he does as he gets nicely up to the back wheel of Mario Schiria. And the pace being set here in this chase group by one of the Palti riders. And it looks as though it was uh, Gianluca Pianagonda who's been very, very active. And like Shandri, seems to have survived well his brief escape and still has some strength left. And you can see in the gaps, uh, the way that back bunch reforms all the time, they still haven't organized themselves, but they're still very much in this race. This is the lead group. Still 11 men. Cedric Vasseur for Gans, Shanley for Motorola, 
Ekimov for the Rabobanks. There's Lonald Brusha on the front now for Festina. Konchenkov again dancing on the pedals. Andre Schmil, the big danger here. Peter Van Petergum riding for TVM, just peeping into the right of our camera there. There he is. And here comes a move by Andre Schmil now, the acceleration from the little Russian rider. And it's clear then that Johan Museo fears Schmil because he's immediately on him, straight away on him. The rider there, Gabriella Massaglia, is the little Italian who's budding in to the big duo there. There he goes. Peter Van Petergum, beat Zeberg. And there's Gonchenkov, his colours of the Roslotto team, always standing out. Rochard are behind him. Cedric Vasseur, the Frenchman, sitting at the back of the group. As we twist and turn our way around the villages here, the riders continue to just hang on to a very tenuous lead. And again, another new Italian name on the block. We see him here, Massaglia. Brochard is feeling like maybe a touch of cramp coming on here. It's getting around to be in the cramp zone now as we head down towards the finish with just two climbs to come. A little bit of a respite and a long ride towards Gerardsbergen, which is where the Mieux de Gramont sits in the town there. And you see that group behind surprisingly is refusing to desist and they are closing in. There could still be a big bunch by the time we get to the Muir. Nine kilometers we've got still to race to the Muir. And in that chase group, the white jersey of the World Cup leader, the winner of Milan San Remo, he's still in the race, Gabriela Colombo. We haven't seen hardly a thing of him, but he is in that second group. And there's a real chance now he could still score points here if he can catch up and go with the final move, which is certain to come on the Mieux de Gramont or the Bosberg. Museo has been at the front all day, monitoring the first. He's ridden a good race, now has he ridden one good enough? Coming from alongside the Berg. Miles, well, kilometers, 25 or about 15 and a quarter miles to go to the finish. Michele Bartoli, number 12 there. Fifth in the line, Max Chandry, Peter Van Piedegum, and the new boy on the block for the Italians today, Missaglia. Well, we've now renamed our second group, the group for Colombo. Tribute to our new World Cup holder, leader rather, not holy yet. That's the honor of Johan Museo in the front group. Taking the World Cup finally last season after two second places, always said, He's not been a man to aim for the World Cup, and yet he's always finished in the top three. The riders trying to bridge the gap here. And this looks like the return of, uh, well, apart from the fact that we've got Fondrius coming up, it looks as though we've got Aldag and um, Olaf Ludwig trying to get away. There's Baldato, second last year. Some tremendous firepower still in this group here, Pianogonda. Carlo Bowmans, and that's Eric Zabel, the sprinter. So it was Zabel who was with uh, Olaf Ludwig, I think. There is Colombo going through. The man who found victory at the first attempt of Milan San Remo, the World Cup leader, and now finding himself possibly in with a shout at some points again here in round number two in Belgium. Looking ahead of the riders there, you can see the tail of the following cars behind those 11 front runners. We're not looking at much more than about 25 seconds, I would think. But it's being left completely here to Telecom because they haven't got a man in the breakaway. And if they can present Zabel with the finish, uh, then he's a very likely sprint winner. Rolf Aldag was setting the pace. So Telecom, the big losers so far of the breakaway. As we now move up to the leaders as Schmil starts to continue the pace, followed by Brochard Ekimov. Superb Russian rider who held at one stage, I think it was 11 world records on the track. 
Sidri Vassar, Nicola Bartoli. Always seems to enjoy his racing in Belgium. Bartoli's had so much success here, winner of the Grand Prix Pinot Cerami as well in years gone by. Peter Van Pietergum. Nice mixture of nationalities. Max Chandry, the Italian with an English license who races on an American team. And somebody's pulled them out at the left of the road there. And it looks as though, in fact, uh, Colombo is in a little bit of trouble here. This is an attack from the second group. And trying to go with it is the telecom team. They've caught Colombo struggling a bit. Different type of race, of course, to Milan San Remo, but he's bridged the gap just that little bit. Andrea Taffy is alongside him, but they're not teammates. Number 107 here is Eric Zabel, the sprinter who won at Charlois in the Tour de France last year. And no doubt we'll hope he'll land one or two stages again this time out. Sort of road which is not conducive to this breakaway now because they can see them and this is where they're going to try and scrabble across quickly before we do arrive in Gerardsbergen. And Petergum sitting at the back behind Johan Museo. Somebody's attempted an attack off the front. It wouldn't surprise me if it's not Andre Schmil. He's the sort of man that goes for these breakaways and he seems to be missing from the line. Akshandri is after him though. It is Schmil, that little dashing figure on the right of the road has tried to get away here. He saved it for one big effort, but they're chasing him down, and it looks as though Museo in the end is going to have to close it down himself. But that counter-attack at that point, I think, was required to lift the impetus of this breakaway because they're in big danger of being picked up. And that looks as though it might be Mikola Bartoli who's just gone off the front now. Good time to put in the counter move when they brought back one. And Museo was the man that finished off the breakaway of Schmill. He's not going to be too keen to go again just yet, and it's Bartoli who's gone this time. Now, there's no organisation. This breakaway was so afraid it was going to get caught. This is what's caused the panic. Museo has found his legs now. Shandri looks over with a little bit of help. He'd like Ekimov to come through. Ekimov does. In fact, Bartoli is here in this group, so we'll find out who's gone in a minute. But that's Bartoli now behind Ekimov. And the group more or less coming back together again. So I think Bartley was clear. He was wiped out there. Now Cedric Vasseur has gone. So Cedric Vasseur goes clear. And uh, I've been trying to find out if he's, if he's related to the famous uh, big professional Alain Vasseur. I even asked the manager of the team, Roger Leger, and he didn't know. I thought he might have known because he actually did employ Cedric. Uh, but he laughed about it but he couldn't give me the answer. So, if anybody knows, send me a little letter as Cedric Vasseur starts the attack. There's some great racing going on amongst this group and surely it's pulling them away from that chase group now, but I'm not so sure it is. And Vasseur, you can see his lead. He's got a very good lead now. And this is an interesting move uh, for Gann to try and get a breakaway going here as the Gan rider goes off up the road. And now we're looking back down the road here at the breakaway. Little bit disorganized, could do with a bit more help, I think. Yekimov is the sort of man who might take it up in the orange jersey there because he likes to go for the long ones as well. He doesn't carry the punch of somebody like Museo when it comes down to the finish. 20 kilometers left to go and still two climbs to come. Cedric Vasseur out on the attack. We've only had one French winner in years of this race, and that was uh, after that long breakaway, you might recall, in 1992 by Jackie Durand, who won ahead of Thomas Wegmuller and then uh, Edwig van Hooydonk. Uh, I think that was the first win since uh, Forestier in 1956. Jean Forestier. French don't win this race very often. And so maybe that's why they're not chasing down Vasseur immediately. He's not a big winner by any manner of means, but neither, neither was Jackie Giron when he won. 
and he's got a nice gap and they're going to leave it to somebody else as usual to do the chasing because he took his chance after a big flurry of attacks and that means the rider's getting a little bit tired he hit them hard at the right time and he's got the gap and he's looking pretty good well this is a fine performance by Vasseur and he is ranked 245 at the start of the season A little bit of a check to see how the break is going. Well, the gap is there. It's a measurable gap now, and if he keeps this up, he'll soon have the following team vehicles. Have a look down, and you see the gap is a good one now. There they are, tucked in on the right of the road as we look at them. All ten that are left here. Russia. 14 seconds they're saying to the Museo group, which is this group here, which is continually splitting up. Gonchenkov marshalling affairs, fourth in line. A superb pursuiting figure of Vyatislav Yekimov. Usually wins the stage of the Tour de France, and when he does, he usually breaks away about a kilometer out and rides everybody off his wheel. But as you get older, of course, you lose that pure speed. And I think uh, Vyacheslav is beginning to lose that pure speed now. Museo just uh, sitting around the back, and Peter van Pietigen knows all about Johan Museu. Bitsiberg. Ekimov. And the surprise move by the Italian Misaglia. Mill goes down the line. There's still plenty of riders working pretty hard in this group. 17 seconds though now. Michele Bartoli comes off the front. Max Chandri goes on the front, digs in deep. See, that line is not fluid. There's uh, one or two going through, and others don't want to. Max drops down on the inside. They've got themselves a better group here now. Six riders seem to be willing to work. Russia, Peter Van Pietigam. I don't think Peter Van Pietigam trusts uh, Johan Muse. He's keeping an eye on him all of the time. We're 45 seconds out now to what is really the main field. That's not very much at all. And 17 seconds is the lead of Vasseur. So they've more or less locked on to him. And he's hovering out front. And we're not very far now from starting our climb in Gerardsbergen. Turning off what appears to be a highway. We now head up towards the town and the Mur de Gramont. And then we'll see just who is strong and left in this breakaway. Because this is where it's going to happen. We're heading up towards the start of the wall now. At, uh, and there it is. Five stars for the Mur. You'll see why any second now. 20% or one in five, and it climbs up to 92 meters. So it's not the height we worry about, no oxygen required from that, but it might be required for the effort because it gets very hard before the top. And it's a Frenchman of all people in the Tour de Flanders who gets us there first in Cedric Vasseur. Hats off to him. Now, if he can still be in the lead over the top of this climb, he can start to think he might be winning the Tour de Flanders. They know it behind as well, and Museo certainly knows it. Museo is still at the back. Whether he wants to stay there, we get onto a narrow cobbled road here. The following cars, by the way, are banned from climbing up this road. They have to go round because they can't take the risk of the car stopping on the climb and not restarting, therefore blocking the whole of the Tour of Flanders. So they're sent around, and the riders are sent up it. Well, a little fellow there at the, uh, from the San Marco group, uh, Miss Aglia, he looks as though he might be a climber, whether he's seen a climb like this before, I have to say I don't know, there he is. What a tiny bicycle frame he rides. Schmill gets a good look at the climb first. Chandri in an excellent place here too. The crouching figure of Yekimov. Up comes the man who set the trend today, Vasseur. Belgian crowd applauding him and cheering him as he heads up towards the tough section. This is the easy bit. Now, bang, onto the tough section. And there's the group just behind him. And as we wind our way towards the top of the climb, you can just take a, just watch his legs here as they gradually slow down as the cobbles begin to bite. And Cedric Vasseur heads off towards the summit. Andre Schmier leads onto the climb. 
and still no attack coming from Johan Musea, which is where I really did think he would. He was sitting at the back to launch an attack right here, but nothing apparent. Smil sets the place on the climb with Bartoli. Behind him is Gonchenkov, Broshar. And they've ridden all the way up here towards the back wheel of Vasseur. That's the difference the hill makes. They'll turn left, they'll see the climb continue. Just a little bit, but over the top here. And you know, they've caught Vasseur. Now they kick again. This is Michele Bartoli who's gone. I expected Museo, but Bartoli's gone. I don't see Museo, in fact. I think Museo has been shed at the back of that group, and Bartoli has gone. Schmill had no answer to that at all, neither has Broshaw. Vasseur is now in trouble and just wishes the climb would end. Ekimov and Chandri go by him, and we haven't seen Johan Museo, and he is going to come up that climb, I think, last of the leaders. So, obviously, something has happened there. Johan Museo is either in trouble with his legs or he has a flat tyre. We'll find out, I hope, as the race goes on, but he's not there. And this is a great ride now by Mikela Bartoli. Brochard and Schmil go over in second and third, followed by Gonchenkov over the top of the Mur de Gramont. Still the Bosberg to come, of course, climb number 16, and still looking for the figure of Johan Museo. Well, whatever happened, happened awfully quickly. There goes the little non-climb, as it turns out, uh, from the San Marco group, and Misaglia. And there's Museo, his hand is up. It looks as though he may well have a flat tyre, and the way he's indicating, it's his back one. And the group is right on him. So the group is right on to Johan Museo. So that's really bad luck. It's come at the most crucial stage of the race when I think uh, Johan Museo would have been planning the attack. Instead, it was an Italian who planned the move, and he has gone. Mikola Bartoli has moved clear of the field here. He's leaving himself an awful long way to ride. He's left with a chasing group. He's lying uh, in the UCI rankings 10th at the moment. That's because of his consistency in the World Cup races last year. Now, behind him, we know we've got Gonchenkov, Shandri, Schmil, Broshaw. I think Vasser is still there. And uh, Vyacheslav Yekimov is the other rider. We'll no doubt switch back to them very shortly. But now we're watching the possibility of yet another Italian World Cup win here. And this is Johan Museo riding alone. I don't know whether he's had a wheel change or what, but he's looked over his shoulder and sees the winner of Milan San Remo go by him. Baldato is here as well. And Fabiano Fontanelli, who's having a great season, is also here. And so he's got a good workmanlike group. Now, I think he sorted out the problem. He doesn't seem to... It seems to me he might have another bike here because he's adjusting the brake at the back. It doesn't look like his normal position, so he could well have changed the bike. Uh, looking around, no, because number one is on the frame, so he hasn't changed his bike, but he's certainly done something to it, and he's now going to try and get back into the action. Well, it is still just about possible, because the breakaway is not that far ahead. And Fal Fabio Baldato, he was uh, second a year ago, is not going to want to take Museo back up there, because this man is his teammate. And Michele Bartoli is now clear. Albeit by a few seconds, but still the climb of the Bosberg to come. If he can get over the Bosberg, he can then go for gold. Tenth in the overall UCI rankings, his best ever position at the start of this year. And that's become uh, possible because of his fine riding last season. Only two wins indeed, but he started off with a fifth place in Milan San Remo, finished seventh in this event, the Tour de Flanders, went on to stay in Belgium and notch a third place in Liege Baston Liege. Came over to Britain, something of a flop there. He only managed 53rd in the Leeds Classic, the world counter on British soil. Then he rode and finished ninth in the Tour of Spain and ended the season on a high note with third in the Tour of Lombardy. So he's got the quality. He seems to enjoy racing and winning in Belgium. And now he's gone. And they're going to have to do something about it. The composition of that chase group is Shandri, Gonchenkov, Schmil, Broshov, Vasser and Ekimov. They are the six riders now, and remember, not very far behind indeed, is a big chase back now currently going on, and Museo is part of it. His race in the last couple of kilometres has been turned upside down. Gonchenkov comes through and off, followed by Yekimov. Oh, in fact, it's Gonchenkov coming through now. And on his wheel, we have uh, Max Chandri. Max Chandri's had a very strong race today. But again, it looks as though a man has slipped away and maybe stolen the victory that Max felt was his because he's such a good rider in a small group. 
Max seems to be the strong man. They're trying to limit the losses without really putting the backs into the chase at the moment. Gonchenkov and Schmill are about to come through. The gap is only seven seconds. They're holding it. And we're now heading on towards the Bosberg. The last climb of the 1996 Tour of Flanders, the 80th edition of this great race. And we're on to the Bosberg. Short and steep again. And an attack by Laurent Brochard. Brochard wants to see the Bosberg first. That's the sort of reaction we expect to see and hope to see because that might close the gap. Everybody looking at one another. That's not going to help at all. Vasseur sitting at the back. I think he's tired. This is the Bosberg. This is the leader. Michele Bartoli dancing over the cobblestones now, heading for the summit. He knows that once over the top of this little lot, he can go for gold. Riding a bicycle, a Fausto copy machine, the most famous Italian cyclist who ever lived. And now his bike looks as though it could be winning a stage, and stage could be winning this particular Tour de Flanders Classic. Laurent Brochard trying to hold off the field and trying to just snip into second place. Festina would love that. And there's the big crowd we can see on the Bosberg. Very orderly Belgian crowd it is too. Here comes the, the leader heading up towards the summit. Brochard is trying to get on terms and is closing. Look at this. It looks a little bit closer than it is because of the angle of the cameras and the hill, but it's still only five or six seconds. And the Brochard is the carrot here to the counter-reaction from the group because Ekimov has almost got him and Schmill, then Gonchenkov, then Max Chiandri, and dangling and hoping is Cedric Vasseur at the back. And what's happened here? Well, this is now a bicycle change from Museo, so whatever was wrong with that bike has now finally been sorted out. We're on the Bosberg as well, so in fact, Johan Museo must be very close to contacting that league group. Well, I don't feel that was a second mechanical problem. I think he may have just hung on to whatever the original problem was, and now he's back in the action. And it looked to me as though he was rather close to that Belgian television motorbike, but uh, maybe the angle of the cameras were a bit deceptive. Back with the leader, still trying to chase down the leader. Over the top now. They know now it's all give all and hope because there's nothing else to stop the winner if you don't go out and get him. There's no more climbs. There's no more cobblestones. There is a minute rise up to the finishing line, but once you turn right and you see that climb you also see the finish banner and then the surge of adrenaline will be all you'll need Konchenkov had a magnificent day out fully deserve it because second in Milan San Remo now proving to us all that was no stroke of luck Andre Schmil second for the past two years in the Tour of Flanders Let's have a look down the road, long straight concrete road. That uh, can be the drawback of the Tour de Flanders because the run in, they can see you if you've only just nipped away from the league group. They're going to see these motorbikes and they're going to see the yellow league car, the sponsoring newspaper. But Michele Bartoli, who has probably had as many victories as most Italians can ever anticipate on Belgian roads. I know there's been a lot of success for some of this. Eddie Merckx in the uh, passenger seat there of the car watching the race. The great Eddie Merckx, of course, who won this race in 1975 and previously to that he won it in 1969. And we are 10 kilometers from the finish. Bartoli settling in now to what he hopes will be a time trial to victory at last. After all of those places, a World Cup, a victory is a real possibility. That is previous best, seventh last year, as I told you earlier, 41st the year before. Continues his progression. The ultimate could be coming his way right now. He's certainly got plenty of fight in those legs at this minute in time. And there's only six riders behind him. We hear that Museo is closing in, but our cameras aren't showing us the pictures. Ekimov, Schmil, Brochard, Shandri, Gonchenkov are the group behind. A little, uh, little glimpse at the old speedometer there, around about uh, 55 kilometers an hour. That's uh, just over 30. There's the chase group. 
And gone from it now is Cedric Vasseur, so he, he was dropped on the Bosberg. As our camera goes searching, the gap has opened enormously, and surely now Bartoli has uh, taken this victory. Even in as far back as 90, only turned pro in 1992, by the way, but in 1993, he showed us just how much respect he had for the Belgian road when he finished seventh in the Flesh Wallon, eighth in Ghent Wavelgum. Then he came back in 1994 and he won the Flesh Brabanson. So he really does enjoy the Belgian roads, which is most unusual for an Italian. They hate the roads, they hate the food, and they usually hate the weather because they just love everything about Italy. Ekimov, just digging that little bit deeper. What a classy bike rider he is. And Andre Schmil sitting nicely behind him, looking very comfortable. Same must be said, too, of Max Chiandri. And Schmil gritting his teeth and accelerating. Chiandri concentrating and just keeping his wheel and not afraid to do his share of the work, and Max never is. But I'm afraid this breakaway is going to feel a little bit discouraged now. There's our man up the road. And with the tricks of the technical whiz of Camry, we can keep our eye on him. But the riders can't because he's out of their sight now. Completely out of their sight as we're counting down the run into the finish. Five miles to go. Inside, five miles to go. At this sort of speed, we're looking at about, oh, about 12 minutes maybe. 12 minutes uh, separating Bartoli from his first ever World Cup win. No more news on the Museo group as to their exact location. But the reports are that they are closing in on these five riders, although we can't see even from our helicopter. And let's have a look. There we go, the long, empty road. Michele Bartoli has made this uh, everything or nothing today. He just went, consolidated on the Bosberg, and has flown over the top. Well known to all the Belgian spectators. Those long, empty roads of a rather late spring in Belgium here. The start of the Spring Classics, of course, really, because uh, coming up, Gemp Wavelgum, and also there's Eddie Merckx there, sitting very passive, the same face he always had when he was racing and winning, and Paddy Roubaix. And by the way, while we're here in Belgium, we have with us a small group of Americans who are enjoying a full week uh, touring around these classic venues uh, with World Cycling Productions, and we thought you might like to see at the end of this program a little video on how they all enjoyed themselves, so I hope you enjoy it as well. Chandri looks over his shoulder. This little group here, I think, feeling somewhat dejected now. Bartoli hit them at the right moment. Laurent Brouchard, Gonchenkov. These are the men on form, though, the men who will go on to the other classics and probably similar names we can expect to see. The Rabobank, a new team, has had their best start on the Jan Rast. Uh, who's had a variety of teams that have not made a great start to the years gone by, but this year they have. Flowing next to Brosha. Then comes Gonchenkov. There isn't, a, there isn't a man not doing his fair share in this breakaway now, except the rider just coming into the picture on the right. I'm trying to get a glimpse of him, but I think somebody's come up to the group. There's Gonchenkov. I think the rider who has made the group, it looks like it might be the Carrera rider, Bietzberg. I don't think Vasser has got back, but we'll check it out. The road has opened up, and although they appear to be working very well together, I think, in fact, they're going slower than the race leader now. And this rider only has to keep his composure and go for gold, and he's got the victory. And that will come in Ninova, in the village of Mierbaker. And in fact, uh, if you were driving from the start of St. Nicholas back to Mierbaker, well, it's only about an hour by car across country to see the start and then rush on to see the finish. But of course, you can also pop out into the hills and see the riders down there as well.
So Mikola Bartoli now trying to give Italy win number two in the World Cup. Colombo, though, has not got up to this group yet, and it was Bietziberg who came on, so that was a fine piece of riding. He's replaced Vasseur in this breakaway, the Swiss rider. And this is the leader again now, and the gap has gone up. It's enormous. 52 seconds, and we're calling it the group Schmill because Museo is still trying to get back on terms, and he hasn't done so yet, and time is running out. And this rider has never hesitated at all as we go under the four kilometres to go banner. So he's just over two and a half miles from the finish with a lead of almost a minute. I don't think anybody's going to bridge it now to Mikola Bartoli. He's going to convert all of his places into a World Cup victory at last. And he keeps his composure and his rhythm. He must be feeling pretty good inside, though. He timed his attack so well as he jumped it just before the Bosberg and then went clear. And the car coming up here is that driven by Giancarlo Ferretti, the manager of the MG Technogym team. And he's going to feel a pretty happy man here as he plays dodgems to try and get up to his man at the front. At the moment, I think Eddie Merckx is talking to him. But he's making his way up, and this will be just for talk only and to cheer him on as we approach the last three kilometres to go. Ferretti alongside him. This man who has coached so many good cyclists, and look at the smile on his face now. Out comes all the information. You're 57 seconds ahead of Schmill's group. You've got it in the bag. Just keep it going. All that will be coming at him now. And just ride to the victory. And now he's on his way, clearly on the road again. In Italy, we've, had, we've seen the Gay Wiss team at win in Milan San Remo. Now the MG team are going to take victory here, but not with Baldato, the man we might have expected to be in at the kill because he was second a year ago, but with Michele Bartoli. He's just ridden with his hands on the centre of those bars, almost relaxed, and almost his wrists were resting on the handlebars there. And here's the car driven by Eddie Max, who still maintains a high degree of interest in the sport, to say the least, and his son, of course, a professional this year, riding with Team Motorola. And this now is the group behind, and you know, this is a much, much bigger group. In fact, Museo is here. Look at the length of this group. Museo has come back, and I don't know how many riders he's brought back with him, but this is now a major group again. So those six chasers have thrown their chance away. Max Chandry included now because there are an awful lot of riders here for company. And Museo has somehow got back. There's beat Ziberg, who was in the original six, but now has a lot of company, Gonchenkov. So Mikhail Bartoli is still ahead of the field, but there is a big race on now for second place. Well, that's uh, an extraordinary piece of riding by Johan Museo. We're one and a half kilometres from the finish here now for Bartoli. So we're just over two kilometres for the Museo group. But he came back literally from the dead there to rejoin that group. It would have been a chase I think we'd have all liked to have seen, but unfortunately, Belgian television didn't show us a single picture of that chase back. But Museo has done it as we now follow the leader in towards the finish, he's down the main street, there's a sharp right at the far end of it, and then it's up the hill to the line. And there's nobody going to touch him now. He's half a mile from the finish, or a kilometre if you like. He's receiving the applause of the crowd all the way along the streets here in Miyabika. And we're going to see an Italian victory, which will be the first one since Gianni Bugno. And uh, Michele Bartoli is going to add his name to not too many Italians to win this great event. There's the group, and just look how big it is now. That group has really swelled up as the riders are coming in for the sprint for second place. And the last look over his shoulder. Now he'll see the finish very, very shortly up the rise as he turns for home. And Bartoli is going to enjoy this. The MG Technogym team are going to clean up again. Well, I say again, they're only second last year. But now they've gone one better. Merckx in the car behind follows in home. He knows exactly how he feels. And he's going to drive all the way to the line here before he relaxes at 100 metres to go. Then comes a salute to Michele Bartoli. Takes World Cup round two, this time the Tour of Flanders for Italy. 
and the MG Technogym rider, an average speed of just over 25 and a half miles an hour for the race. Now the big sprint, and right in the thick of this big sprint now is Johan Museo again. He's trying to get a good lead out here. Andre Schmil is right there as well. And so to on the far right is Ekimov, but he really isn't the big sprinter. Yeah. Ekimov, Schmil might be though. Baldato's coming on the left. This is going to be a very tight. It could be a one-two. It's Baldato in the centre. One-two for MG Museo. I don't think has got it on the line. Fabio Baldato, Johan Museo, and uh, then came Ekimov. So it wasn't a bad sprint by the Russian. He got fourth. And Fabiano Fontanelli, I think, was up there in fifth place. But there is the rider who did so much and in the end didn't get the reward he would have deserved, Max Chandry. Max, that was a tough race, and it looked as if it was going to be in the bag there until Bartoli jumped away on the Mur de Gramont. Yeah, you know, it's, it's a shame all day in the front, and I nearly fell here in the sprint, so probably didn't get me in the 10th, in the 10th place, so... It was but a hard race, but uh, Johan Museo had a lot of bad luck too. Were you surprised when he came back? Yeah, you know, I just don't like the way they race. Just riding in the front all day, I mean, what is that? That's not riding, you know, that's not just... Didn't have no tactics to the race, just riding in the front, his teammates, and that was about it. What about next week, Paris Roubaix? <laughs> Another week, we'll see. We certainly will, Max. We wish you all the best because the work rate has been quite tremendous. Max finishing, in fact, in 16th place. This is what happens when you win the race because people make a big fuss of you. And Michele Bartoli is really going to enjoy the next few minutes of the Tour de Flanders because now the hard work is over and the pleasurable bit, the congratulations coming first from Giancarlo Ferretti, the MG director sportif, and the Italians always know how to say, well done. And, of course, the team getting first and second. Uh, and this uh, here, the victory, as he reaches for the sky, because this is one of the best classic races to win. Michele Bartoli taking the flag in solitude, which is always the best way to win a bike race anyway. Is there any stopping the Italians? Well, that's what the whole world of cycling, I think, is asking these days. They all seem to be riding so very, very well. A look at the final result, Michele Bartoli winning from his teammate Baldata, then Museo, Ekimo Schmil, Jesper Skibbe getting good sixth, Lola Brochard taking seventh, and Rolf Sorensen, despite his puncture, he got tenth place on the day. And so now we have yet another Italian name to conjure with, that of Michele Bartoli. Leading his MG team to a 1-2 today in the Tour of Flanders, he finished with enough time in hand to see his own teammate, Fabio Baldato outsprint Johan Museo. Museo taking third, and that was a good result considering he had that problem on the Mieux de Gramont. So Johan, in his last four tours of Flanders, has now had two wins, a second and a third. What a great record. On behalf of Paul Sherwin, I'm Phil Liggett saying so long for now. the canals do smell in Ghent and it would be all the worse if they didn't because you wouldn't be in a country which loves the sport and which the people always love you. Our little group enjoyed their 10 days following the big classic races, Ghent-Wavelgum, the Tour of Flanders, Paris.